Hey there art nerds. So it is a chilly cold wintry day today here in Louisiana and I am all wrapped up in a snug sweatshirt under a weighted blanket and I thought today was a perfect day to share this lo-fi watercolor illustration with you guys. So this is inspired by the lo-fi beats girl. It's a pretty ubiquitous image. It's usually a girl studying, drawing, hanging out, chilling, wearing headphones, zoning out and listening to music. I wanted to put my own spin on this with Kara. So everything shown here is gonna be in miniature. This is a watercolor tutorial and walkthrough. The materials you need are, you know, watercolors, watercolor paper. I'm gonna give you guys some of my favorites, some suggestions, but those are just suggestions. Feel free to work with what you like to paint with. So grab your paints, grab your paintbrushes and let's paint. I'm starting with my sketch already penciled onto my Canson Moulin de Roy watercolor paper. I'm using a cold press watercolor paper here and the art was penciled using an HB mechanical pencil. So just hard enough that it won't smudge, but it'll still be visible while I'm painting. The original sketch was done digitally using Photoshop and I've shared the process in my shorts as well as over on my TikTok if you guys are curious. So I'm stretching my watercolor paper and I have kind of a two-step stretching process. This is what works for me, but if you have a different process, feel free to use that process if you want to. So I find that it works best if I saturate the back of the paper first, give it a chance to soak in, uh, mop up the extra water using some Viva paper towels, flip it over, saturate it again with some clean water, mop that up, and what what that does is it activates the blue dyes that were in my printed blue lines. Then I saturate it again. This is the time that's actually meant to stay on the paper. Mop up the excess. I'm using 3M blue painters tape. I apply it to my arm to remove some of the excess tack and then I brush on some clean water. For some reason I find that working with damp tape helps it adhere a little bit better to the damp watercolor paper. I start with one short side, do both the long sides and then I come around and I do the other short side and I found that this helps prevent it from buckling. If I were to do short and short it might buckle or long, uh, short, long, short and then long it might buckle. This is just years and years and years of me doing this technique I've found what works best for me but feel free to experiment and let me know down in the comments what you guys find works best for you and while it's drying out I am using some binder and some bulldog clips just to hold it tight against the gator board and I'm using gator board not foam core because it's not absorbed it's not going to absorb any water so it's a lightweight support that isn't going to buckle once it fully dried, actually way after it fully dried, I've had this sitting around in my studio for quite a while now. I'm starting with a toning wash to establish the lighting. And I don't have it on camera, but I actually did some color comps to help me figure out how I wanted the lighting to go. And I referenced those throughout this illustration. So I have a light source. It's a pretty strong light source here. It is a flashlight attached to the ceiling. And I really want to indicate that this is a strong source of light and it's lighting up Kara's drawing area. So I've got some yellow and I'm blocking that in. And then I'm also using some Daniel Smith Moon Glow mixed with a little bit of probably Payne's Gray, maybe neutral tint to create this kind of nice grayish color that really granulates. And I want that granulation because it's going to create this sort of soft mistiness to our shadows and to our background, which I think works really well with this sort of lo-fi, very chill vibe that I'm going for today. And I'm utilizing the grise technique to kind of do some underpainting to get those shadows established early on, to get some of that granulation in there earlier on. And for the flowers, I used a clean paper towel just to lift up some of that gray so it wouldn't be quite as strong in the shadows there. That's a pretty easy technique to use, just a clean paper towel, dab up some of the extra paint. On cotton rag watercolor paper, you're gonna get a really good lift, especially with granulating colors like this. Staining colors do have a, more of a tendency to stain the paper, but I didn't wanna lift it all the way back up. I just wanted it to be light enough that it um, wouldn't be super distracting and it wouldn't really 
modulate the color too much. So I'm using that to help me create my light and shadow. I'm also making sure since Kara is sitting in the light, there's actually gonna be a lot of shadow and a lot of contrast on her because she's blocking the light source with her body, with her face. And I really wanted to indicate that early on as well. That's gonna kind of remind me as I'm coloring her, as I'm painting in those colors of where those shadows are. And it's also very easy at this stage to utilize this kind of technique where I'm kind of underpainting and I'm knocking in all the shadows. I'm doing kind of a monochromatic painting because um, this is a lot easier at this stage rather than trying to add those shadows, to glaze those shadows in later on and risk all the paint that I originally put down coming up and turning to mud on me. So all cobbled together without any of the dry times included, this illustration took six hours of painting to complete. Now that doesn't mean it only took six hours. It actually took about two days and I was working on it pretty consistently. And I was surprised that it was a six hour painting when I stitched all the video together because it felt like it went so much faster. I guess I was having a good time as I was painting it. But uh, sometimes if I'm struggling with a painting, it feels like it takes forever. And then I edit it and it's only an hour long. And then sometimes it feels like it just flies by and I edit it and it took six hours, huh? So I like to disclose how long it takes me to paint things because I feel like that kind of offsets the fact that we've time-lapsed this. And this has actually been very heavily time-lapsed because six hours, no one is gonna sit and watch a six hour painting video, maybe a live stream, that's more like hanging out, but we really needed to get it into a shorter, easier to consume format. And I spent a lot of time kind of doing the grise and waiting for it to dry and doing the grise and waiting for it to dry. And I apologize, my head is gonna get in the shot sometimes. I had to really pull the camera back so that you guys could see what I was doing, which means it's difficult for me to not get in between me and the camera because I need to see what I'm doing too. So if you guys see me peeping into the shot there, I tried to work around it as best as I could, but sometimes we do have to make compromises between like getting a good video and making a good piece of art. And in this instance, I really wanted to make a good piece of art. I really liked the initial sketch. I was really happy with it. And I really wanted that to show through in the final illustration. So this is more of me kind of taking you guys along with me when I'm painting a watercolor piece rather than me creating a watercolor piece that I could then, or creating a watercolor piece to be a tutorial, if that makes sense. So lately you guys have seen me talking a lot about granulating and super granulating watercolors and I really love what they can bring to your art because I've really been trying to work on fighting against this sort of paint by numbers look that my art can tends to get if I stay, you know, too clean or if I color inside the lines too much. And one of the ways I worked to combat that was really focusing on my brushwork and relying on my brushes to do more of the painting so that I'm not just filling something in by rote. I'm really utilizing the brush strokes and letting those still shine through. But adding additional working with paints that have more granulation or have more interesting working properties is another way that I've been able to kind of add some liveliness and kind of loosen up my work. If you have kind of a coloring book style with where everything is neat and colored within the lines and it works for your art, that's great. I am not at all saying anything negative about it. I just felt like it wasn't really working for my art and not really kind of telling the stories that I wanted to be able to tell or capture the vibrancy or the mood that I really wanted to capture. So finding ways to kind of loosen up my work has really helped me kind of break out of my shell. So once I finished all that initial grise, and you guys saw, I spent a long time working on the grise. I'm going to start working on blocking in some of the larger areas. So I mixed up a brown to use for the background. So Kara's a Lilliputian. She lives in a dollhouse. If you guys read my comic, Seven Inch Kara, there's kind of a set color scheme for the interior of their house. And when I'm painting, even though this is taking place in kind of a a room that doesn't exist in the dollhouse in the comic. It could exist. It's just one I haven't shown yet. Um, it, it, the, the rooms are generally kind of just a cream color, like almost like a white wash that's aged a little bit. So that's something that I wanted to go with because um, Seven Inch Kara has a lot of really natural earthy colors for the color palette. 
And uh, when I'm painting Kara, that's generally something that I like to kind of stay true to and reflect. And also it just reads well as a wall color. It's easy to mix, it's not too distracting, and it really allows the objects in the room to have a chance to shine. And another reason I like it is that when I'm painting Kara as a comic, there's a lot of panels that might have a toned background for emphasis or to push an emotion. And by having those kind of cream color walls, when I change the background color, it's more clear, I think, that it was done for emphasis. So I like it because it's kind of a neutral color that I can kind of adjust to suit the tone and the mood in the individual scene of the comic. So that's just something that also kind of carries through when I'm doing these sort of standalone watercolor il illustrations as well. So I wanted this to feel not sad, not melancholy, which I feel like lo-fi stuff sometimes starts to trend into that. I wanted it to feel kind of warm and cozy, but very quiet and peaceful. So the color choices, I went with very warm colors. Even the blues that I mixed are very warm colors. And I just try to <laughs> not, not get too dark with things. Like even though she's sitting in a darker room with a really strong light source, I didn't go super dark with the shading because I didn't necessarily want it to have this very dramatic feel. I wanted it to have a very peaceful feel. So to my left, I actually have a printout of the digital sketch so that I can, as things get obscured, as I'm painting them, it's easier for me to reference that. It's just right there. And often I'll have it pulled up on my computer screen when I'm penciling or painting something and I wanna make sure that I don't lose what I'm painting as I add layer and layers and layers and more layers. Uh, but my computer was out of order for the time. So uh, a printout worked quite well in this instance. So at this point I can start blocking in the local color, the colors that these things actually are. And I wanted to start with our darkest, more shaded area of the painting to make sure that I really convey that. So when I was painting my light source, um, the way I like to do that is I kind of treat it the same way I treat glass, where I do paint it through. I do paint those earlier kind of toning washes to establish the local color of the object, like the very light brown for the background walls. But then as I'm developing details and shadow within my light source, I leave those very light. I don't do a lot of layers on top of it. I don't do a lot of additional details more like the light is a little bit blinding and it's kind of started to obscure some of those details because your eyes haven't had a chance to adjust. Now, if I were going the opposite way, if I wanted to depict like an area that's really, really shadowed in an otherwise very bright room, I would just do the opposite where I leave the shadows very obscured and maybe knock the colors down quite a bit, have things really desaturated, don't add a lot of detail. And then the things that are in light would be clearer, easier to see with more detail and more shadow. So it kind of just depends on how you want to approach your light source, what kind of story you want to tell with your light source. So in this instance, I chose to allow the light to actually obscure things rather than making them a little bit easier to see. Now, all that underpainting is going to definitely knock the color saturation down on the crayons and color pencils that are close to her feet, which is what I wanted. Um, I do still want them to read as generally these bright, vibrant things, but since Kara's working in a darker room, the colors are gonna be a little bit darker. And that's actually an area I kind of found myself struggling with a little bit, especially with some of the more opaque and brighter colors. And you guys are gonna see me kind of mess around with that and kind of figure out different ways of handling it. I don't wanna say like, this is the best way to do it, or this is the way to do it. It's just the way that I chose to do it in this instance didn't work the best. Um, another thing is that even though I had my dehumidifier running and you guys have heard me, I live in Southeast Louisiana and it's humid here like all the time. And I always have a dehumidifier running unless I'm actively recording audio. That's the only time I don't. And I always have either the AC or the heat running cause that really helps <laughs> make it bearable, honestly. And it, it also helps, air conditioning does condition the air. It actually takes out some of the moisture from the air and it makes your work environment easier to work in and easier to control. And that's, that's important to me. I wanna be able to reproduce things. I wanna be able to make things consistently and knowing the humidity that I'm dealing with makes that a lot easier. So even though I had my dehumidifier and my air conditioner running, um, I still had a lot of dry time issues because it was just a very rainy weekend. We had a big cold front come in and that always 
brings a lot of rain. So um, I was kind of, that was one of the areas where I was kind of struggling. I was having a really, really long uh, dry times. I was having colors bleed into each other when I didn't want them to or bleeding into the next area when I didn't want them to. And I'm just pointing that out because I know that's something that people, other watercolor artists often struggle with. And I have found that having a dehumidifier has helped a lot. In fact, off camera, when while waiting for this to dry, once the water soaked into the paper and there was no chance of the pigments moving or shifting or settling downward, I would move it into the room where I keep my dehumidifier because I have found that that has really helped. And I also find that in my opinion, it works a lot better than using a hair dryer because the hair dryer is applying heat and that helps dry it out. Whereas a dehumidifier is sucking out the moisture and that just works better for me and that might be something that you guys find worth you know checking out or trying out yourselves so i'm one of those artists who really loves to draw lots of tiny things lots of details as you guys can see here but i don't always love to paint it i have to really be in a mood for that and then of course when i'm in that kind of mood then it's like ah give me all the details i want all the details but when I am like in a draw all the details but not paint all the details mood, it can be hard to kind of get myself to do that, to kind of gear myself up to all the color mixing and all the painting. So to make it a little bit easier for myself, I went with pretty standard colors for the crayons and the color pencils. And you also see me reusing a lot of the same colors. Um, that not only does that make it easy or easier, it also kind of helps me create a more unified color palette when we're dealing with kind of a wide array of colors. I found that having repeating colors and um, even if you have a lot of colors, you know, having them pop up throughout the illustration can really help kind of tie the whole thing together. So long as it doesn't become like overkill, you know, you want it to be an accent color, not take over the whole thing. But the grise underpainting, because it knocks all the colors down and there's a common shadow color, a common base color underneath everything, it kind of helps to tie everything together as well. So another trick for painting these kind of shadowy yet colorful things is to not worry too much about rendering them out too fully early on. That's something that I'm gonna like eventually kind of walk away from, come back to it later on after I have more of the illustration painted. I'm also going to save Kara for pretty much the end, mostly because I already know what I want to do with her. The only thing I was kind of up in the air with was the color of her shirt. And I had some ideas, but I really wanted to see how the rest of the color palette played out before I decided on a shirt, because you can use that to add contrast. You can use that to kind of draw attention, which is what I want to do. She's literally sitting underneath a spotlight. So I wanted to make sure that whatever she was wearing brought additional attention to her. Tonight I'm painting with my Daily Driver watercolor palette, plus some of my super granulating Daniel Smith watercolors that I have kind of in their own special, like these are super granulating colors palette because I've gotten so obsessed with super granulating colors. But uh, I've talked about my Daily Driver palette quite a few times here on the channel. I definitely have a video where I talk about it in, in some depth, but it's kind of a nice hodgepodge of the best of all the different watercolor brands that I've reviewed jammed into a single palette. I used to paint primarily from pre-made half pans like Windsor and Newton half pans but I found that that's very very expensive and I felt kind of limited with the colors and the abilities that those colors have so what I do now is I actually fill my half pans from tubes because I do prefer to work from dried watercolors and then I just add water I spritz them with water as I go and I find that that works great for me it's way more economical I'm not going through half pans as quickly as I used to many tubes of watercolors cost the same amount as a half pan but you can get like three refills, three to sometimes even five refills, depending on the size of the tube from a single tube. So it's way more economical for me. And it really opens me up to different brands that I've enjoyed using. I can just pop them in half pans, let them dry and work from there. So it's a combination of Winsor Newton, Daniel Smith, Sennelier, a lot of core, some Holbein, um, might be some Magello still in there. It's hard for me to find Magello, so I've been working away from it, even though I love Magello watercolors. And there's even a little bit of, oh, dang it, the name slips me. But basically, there's a lot of different brands in there. I'm not particularly brand specific or brand loyal if I like how the paints handle. And if I like the color, I'm probably going to pop it into my Daily Driver palette. 
So the ferns behind Kara are a really good example of how I like to handle lighting in this kind of an illustration. So I have the base color, that the highlight color, and I'm going to leave that as the dominant color for the part of the fern that would be lit or would be in the beam of the flashlight. And then once we cross that beam, I basically fill in the rest of those leaves with the darker color. And then I dab in some beautiful Daniel Smith undersea green, wet and wet to start developing shadow and to start getting in some nice grittiness and some actual fern color. But this I think better illustrates my point of how I like to think about handling color in this sort of an instance where the light would be kind of blinding. So something that isn't really shown here, but I'd like to point it out so that you guys know is that in order to get like a good vantage point on this illustration and to reach everything that I needed to reach as I was painting, I was standing for the majority of this watercolor illustration and it wrecked havoc on my back. So one of the ways I combat the constant strain of fatigue and fatigue of working as a watercolor illustrator and as an illustrator and comic artist in general is I like to treat myself to massages sometimes, upper back and neck massages and I found that that's really helped with uh, just the strain of being an illustrator and the frequent migraines. So if you find that you're having a lot of upper back, upper neck tension, you're getting a lot of headaches, honestly treat yourself to a massage. I find that it really helps out a lot and I thought it was worth pointing out because as artists, we will often treat ourselves to art or we'll treat ourselves to comics or we'll treat ourselves to movies or books, but we don't necessarily treat ourselves to things that are going to actually kind of give us a longer working life and improve our general quality of life. So those of you who hang out with me and paint with me often know that I like to work small for the most part. Even though when I'm painting comic pages, they're on 10 by 14 watercolor paper, it's usually broken down into smaller panels. So no individual illustration on average is larger than say eight by 10 inches. And you know, on occasion, I do like to work larger like this, but I'd never get super big partially because in general, I like to be able to record what I'm doing and I do have limited desk space. So anything bigger than 12 by 16 starts getting really unwieldy and difficult for me to be able to manage. I think it would be fun to do some larger pieces, but it's not necessarily something that's super pressing for me at this time. So since this was on Cans and Melinda Roy and they have kind of weird, they, they're metric, so their Imperial is kind of weird. It's like 15, 0.8 by 11 point something something like that so this is a little bit larger than you know the majority of what you guys see from me but I still had a lot of fun painting it I'm mostly pointing it out because ah my hair entering the shot again I have to hover over it and <laughs> I have curly hair and it sometimes likes to swoop in front of my camera so it, it happens from time to time but um, it basically it kind of necessitated me standing because it does take up the majority of my desk. Working at a standing desk would definitely alleviate some of that and maybe at some point uh, someone will make a drafting table. So I work at a drafting table but I don't like tilting it up because everything rolls off the desk and as you guys can see I work with like everything on my desktop. And also it, for me, it's just not conducive to the way that I like to work. So I end up standing and like double checking my work a lot because you do, if you work on a flat desk surface, you do want to stand up and look at your work often because otherwise it can end up getting really skewed where you drew the head really big because it's further away from you and thus it seems smaller and the feet really small because they're closer to you and thus they seem bigger especially when you're working on a flat plane and you're sitting really close to your work area so it's good to either when you're doing your initial sketching and you're blocking everything out to have that up at an angle where you can see everything really clearly and you can kind of check all the proportions or to stand and check your work pretty often. That's not necessarily such a big deal with a watercolor illustration like this. I'm just short and my reach is not, even though I have really long arms, my reach is still not great. So it's better if I just stand up and kind of ho hover over it as I paint. So 
In this illustration, Kara has some bits of colored glass hung up in her window, kind of like stained glass or like a sun catcher. Um, and I really wanted to convey that it was glass or even colored plastic would have been fine. So what I do is I start by painting kind of our really light initial highlight color. And then I paint through and add in a bit of the blue so that we can see that it's a transparent object. It's showing us what we're seeing through the window. And then I'm going to go ahead and add the darker colors of, of each individual piece of glass on top of that as I work. So once I got most of the background kind of blocked in, I realized I really wanted to add some more depth and some more shadow, add some more contrast and add some more drama. So I'm using my initial mix of our moon glow with a little bit of shadow violet or shadow purple, which is a granulating color that has purple and lunar black in it, as well as some neutral tint just to kind of start getting some darker shadow in there. And I honestly did not care if the colors kind of bled into each other at this point, I was really just trying to get a little bit more depth and a little bit more shadow going on there. And that took forever to dry, but when it finally did dry, I was able to start working on blocking in the colors for Kara herself. I didn't want to get too far into this illustration before I started painting Kara because she is, you know, the focus of the illustration, the most important part. And I hope I did a good job of conveying her miniature world. I didn't want it to be like immediately apparent when I do tiny people stuff. I really love doing tiny people stuff from their perspective rather than from a full size human perspective. I really like kind of reimagining the world and drawing the world from their point of view and how they would reutilize things and how they would go about their day Daily lives so um, I really wanted that to be apparent in this piece and I really wanted it to make it really inviting and to make you want to know more about this character and get to know her a little bit better by the things that I chose to include in the illustration so in the comic Kara loves to draw she doesn't really get much of an opportunity to do it just if you read the comic you'll kind of understand why but she also loves to draw so it was really important for me to include some art supplies and have her downtime activity be chilling out and drawing she's got a pair of ear pods strapped to her head uh like they would be like cans uh, i i prefer cans myself i don't like putting little things in my ears it really bothers me but kara doesn't have a whole lot of choice so i guess it would be this or maybe listening to music over a speaker don't ask me what the music source is i could not <laughs> I guess I could tell you, but that would be comic spoilers probably later on. And then she's also got all these plants in the same room as her. She's got little lawn asters and she's got violets and she's got ferns and she's got some green thing growing in the back there behind her. So having nature as, you know, an element in this illustration shows that it's really important, not just to Kara, but to me as the person creating the comic, as the storyteller. And then I do have some decorative elements, although like there's stamps on the wall behind her that gives a sense of scale and it also just kind of creates decoration she's not just sitting in the sterile environment she's got some decorative bits of glass hanging in the window to catch the light which kind of I think implies someone who's hoping for brighter days or who enjoys brighter days someone who has kind of an optimistic outlook because you're waiting for the sun to come in and light things up so that kind of implies a more optimistic outlook and uh that's most of the room. She's got art supplies. She's got plants. She's got some bits of glass. She's sitting by a large window. The window has a little bit of eyelet lace and a curtain. Nothing is super fussy or overly girly because, you know, Kara herself isn't. She's, um, she's very outgoing and very friendly and very easy, easy to like. But she's not a particularly fussy person or a particularly particular person in most instances. So hopefully this room kind of conveys that as well. I really like thinking of the environment as a character in the story where you can learn more about the world and learn more about people's values and what they like and what they enjoy and learn more about the characters themselves by taking time to create these environments that really tell you what kind of world it is. So I do enjoy doing environment and background design from time to time. Uh, my only problem is all those straight lines that I have to draw for perspective can get kind of tedious, but I had a lot of fun with that for this illustration here. 
So this illustration wasn't really too challenging to paint. It was just a lot to paint. And also it had been sitting around for so long and I'd been looking at it and thinking, oh, I really want to do a good job with this. I really want to do it justice. That it starts to kind of build up in your head and you're really kind of setting yourself up for failure. Um, I've said before, and I, I didn't make this up. This came from somewhere else. I wish I could credit them, but I don't remember who said this, that 80% uh, of art is thinking and 20% is doing. And I do agree with that, you know, spending time thinking about the color palette, thinking about the supplies you want to use, thinking about how you want the light to come out, all that, that is important. But when honestly, it's just sitting around and you're just kind of looking at it and thinking about it for weeks as you're moving and dealing with a hurricane and a thousand other things, then that's definitely not 80%. That's starting to get into like, I don't know, you've just spent 98% of your time thinking and 2% of your time doing. And the problem with that is you start setting yourself up for failure because it, it kind of builds up in your head. You're not getting better ideas for how to handle it, but you're just thinking the whole time about how you want it to look really good and how you really like the line art and you really want to live up to that. And it kind of gets to the point where almost anything you do is going to disappoint you for a while. And that's why I recommend if you painted a piece that you're not really happy with and you're not really sure why there isn't like a particular reason, particularly good reason why you don't like it. There isn't something that you could identify and work on in the future that you set it aside for a few days. Don't look at it and then come back to it. And Honestly, sometimes I will make something and have spent a lot of time on it and have really worn myself out. And then I, I, I really don't like it when I'm done with it. And it doesn't do well on social media. So I start to feel kind of bad about it. So I put it away for a while. And then I might be looking for pieces to sell at a show or pieces to use in a display or, or something like that. And, uh, you know, I look at this piece that I haven't looked at in a really long time. And I'm like, oh, hey, I actually really like this piece. And I think the reason for that is you've kind of broken what you built it up to be in your head, what you thought it should be, and it failed to be that in your head. Uh, you've broken that from the piece. So you can just look at the piece that you made and be like, oh, yeah, it turned out pretty good. I'm actually pretty happy with it. So at this point, I'm kind of alternating between, you know, tweaking the background and working on Kara. And it's basically like I do something on Kara and while I'm waiting for it to dry or while I'm thinking about it, I work on some of the background elements, adding some detail here, adding some contrast there. I don't necessarily like doing step by step tutorials on illustrations like this. Uh, I like talking more about like the concept and the process than I do about like, OK, and then we're going to use red on this. So on Kara's shirt, I decided I wanted to go with a hot pink. I thought that would be a really good contrast with the background. It would be a really bright color that would draw your attention. And it's a color she doesn't wear often either. So I, I thought it would be a nice contrast. So I have found that it's easier for me when I'm working with pinks that I start with the shading first. So I'm using a granulating purple. It might be Rose of Ultramarine. I don't remember off the top of my head. So that I could get, cause I didn't, I felt like I didn't really get enough depth of shading on Kara herself since she is directly blocking the light source. We would have more shading and I didn't want to like totally shade her face so that you guys couldn't see it anymore. So I opted to do a lot of the shading on the shirt. So instead of it just being this bright pink color, I wanted to kind of bake in, develop in some of the shading earlier on. So I'm using a granulating purple to kind of continue that sort of misty shading granulation effect that I worked so hard for in the background. You guys have probably noticed in my attempts to get the crayon shaded enough so that they actually look like they're in shadow, I basically <laughs> have turned them into mud, which is fine. I kind of figured that was going to happen. What I really wanted with the crayons was more like pops of color as they kind of neared the light source, just the hint that we have a, a net full of really colorful crayons hanging underneath Kara's uh, it's like a clipboard, her clipboard desk. So I am going to go back in later on using watercolor pencils and kind of bring some of that color back. But it's not something that I was really too concerned about at this point. And now we can really start getting in there with the pink. This is actually a Magello pink. It's Compos Rose. Uh, yes, you can achieve pinks by, you know, just like watering down red. But I really wanted kind of a blue influence pink. And I find that working with like magenta or Compos Rose 
windows is just a better way to get those kind of pinks than just, you know, letting the water do its job. And I'm also able to get much more saturated kind of vibrant pinks working this way. I am a big convenience color person. That's why I have this massive daily driver palette. I really like being able to, I do like mixing colors and I often mix colors, but I also like kind of starting from kind of a good background or a good close approximation and then mixing a little bit to get what I want rather than mixing and swatching, mixing and swatching, mix, mixing and swatching. And that's just preference on my part. It's a convenience thing. As a watercolor comic artist, when you're painting hundreds of pages, you don't want to have to be constantly mixing up, you know, all the colors that you need all the time from a limited palette of say 12 colors. So, you know, um, even though you can paint pretty much everything you need from a decently picked collection of 12 colors depending on what you want to paint I mean a landscape painter is going to have different needs than a portrait artist and a portrait artist is going to have a different different set of needs than I have so um you know it, it is a little bit of a stretch to say you absolutely can paint everything you need with a 12 color palette and be 100% happy with it all the time uh so I, I don't even try to do that I work with a great big convenience color palette that I'm really happy with and I really like the colors and I haven't actually added anything new to that particular palette but I do have have two maybe three side palettes going on so um I guess I'm one to talk I'm just one of those all the colors all the excess all the time forever so at this point I can really start going in and adding in the darker shadows trying to define things a little bit more um you're gonna hear see my hair a lot more in the shots because I'm I really need to see what I'm doing and clean things up a bit because so one of the problems with painting something large while recording and trying to avoid being in the shot is I do end up with a lot of areas where so that I didn't like paint over the lines and get into the wrong area I left it white or I didn't bring it close enough just by accident you know because I couldn't see super well so this is a good opportunity for me to go in and kind of clean things up and kind of tighten things up and that's one of the reasons it ends up taking a while is you know going back in and cleaning things up and tightening them up but I do think that really ties the piece together and it makes it feel more finished now I do I do personally feel like a lot of my pieces are kind of over rendered and that's something that I want to work on, but you know, it's, it's a working process. I would rather it look a little over rendered than like I just completely phoned it in. And as somebody with ADHD, you know, I have been accused of phoning things in many times. <laughs> So maybe this is just me overreacting. So one area that I did overwork and I kind of regret that is Kara's hair. I really should have left the back half, the half that is tilted up and would be closer to the light source and more likely to catch more of the light. I really should have left that lighter. I should have trusted my gut and gone with that. And instead I wanted to make her hair color more apparent. So I should have done kind of half and half where the back half is much lighter and the front half is much darker and just trusted that that was going to read correctly. But I overthought it and I overcorrected it and that kind of spoils it in a way. It spoils the effect a little bit. I don't think it spoils it so much that it's like ruined. I just think that it's not quite as good as it could have been. So I did do a significant amount of editing to try and crop myself out of most of the shots, but <laughs> there's points where it's just not really feasible or it would basically turn it into like editing mush. So that kind of makes me wonder, how close do you guys have to get to your watercolor illustrations to see the fine details? I have to get like right on top of them. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, other artists I know are pretty similar, especially people who work small, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering like, is that just me and all my friends have poor eyesight? Or is this something that's kind of ubiquitous to artists who typically work smaller than like, say mural size? So at this point, everything's been blocked in. A lot of the shading has been done. Mostly I'm just going in with smaller brushes and adding in some of the tighter, finer, darker details to try and pull some delineation and to get some contrast and to make sure that everything's readable. I'm not super worried about all the highlights at this point, mostly because I do definitely still rely on using watercolor pencils and a little bit of gouache to pull those highlights in. I'm a big believer in you use the tools that help you get 
what you had in mind out onto your paper. So I don't really worry too much about whether or not something fits into like traditional watercolor or not. I went to school for comics and uh, that's a pretty big one in comics is you do what you got to do to get the job done. And I still stand by that. I think in the end, as long as the piece looks good and you're happy with it, that's what's really most important. When it comes to using watercolor pencils, I like to give the watercolor illustration I'm working on a good chance to dry out. So the surface is more receptive, it's had a chance to dry so it's not so mushy anymore and it's gonna take the pencil a whole lot better. Even if I'm gonna go in later on with water to kind of soften the effects or lighten the transitions, I still like to start with the paper fully dry when I'm going in with watercolor pencils. And I've talked about my favorite watercolor pencils so many times, but if you're looking for some recommendations, I have a bunch of watercolor pencil reviews for you guys, but my favorites and the ones you guys are gonna see me using here are the Canon Dash Museum Aquarelle, or Museum, yeah, it's Museum Aquarelle, and those do tend to be kind of expensive. So while I really like them, it's harder to recommend them because it's like, whew, $4 a watercolor pencil is a lot of money to spend on a watercolor pencil. So I don't have a whole lot of them, but I do also really like the um, Alpric Dur watercolor pencils. And those are actually India ink, as are the Derwent Inktense pencils. So both of those are India ink pencils, but they are great. They give you some really vibrant colors. And I also really like the Karen Dash Super Color 2 watercolor pencils. And those three options are much cheaper than the Museum Aquarelle. So you guys are going to see me using a lot of those, especially as I'm like slowly, slowly buying more and more of the Museum Aquarelle. I do believe, even though I review a lot of student grade art supplies here on the channel, I do believe that if you're serious about art, you should make the investment in yourself and in your supplies and buy things as you can afford them. So I buy a lot of things open stock one at a time because that's what I can afford to do. I can't afford to sink $400 in something, but I can maybe afford to sink $4 at a time over five years into something. So I'm not gonna be one of the ones to be like, go out and sink a whole bunch of money into something you might not even like. Even though it does cost more in the long run to buy things open stock, it also allows you to focus on the colors that you prefer and actually use rather than a set of colors where you do get a bunch that you, you're only gonna use on occasion. And it, it's just sometimes a little bit easier and, and more feasible to buy a few at a time here and there rather than sinking a lot of money into them in one go. So while I like to use nice art supplies when I can afford to do so, I never just go out and buy the whole thing in one go. It's bought a little bit over time over a long span of many, many years. So when I finished with my watercolor pencils and they had a chance to dry and I used the watercolor pencils to kind of shift the colors, particularly with the crayons down in the net below, it allowed me to put another layer of color that was slightly more opaque. So it would show up a little bit better in the darkness. And I didn't do that all over the entirety of the crayon more like uh, mostly where the light would be hitting so you'd actually see the color more. And I did use some clean water to just kind of blend that out so that the transition isn't so harsh. But I am now going in with some white gouache just to add in some rim lighting, add in some highlights. Uh, that helps pull some additional details too because we're adding back in some contrast. We're adding in the light end of our contrast. And it also gives me a chance to kind of adjust some of the stuff with the watercolor pencils. And then once everything has had a chance to dry fully and you guys have gotten totally sick of looking at my nose, I remove my blue painter's tape, pulling away from the paper at a 90 degree angle. I loosen the back of it first. It makes it easier to remove. It is going to tear the paper a little bit. It does disturb the surface texture. I haven't found a tape yet that won't though, and it does do it the least that I have found. And by pulling away at a 90 degree angle, it's not pulling into the illustration. So I'm not going to actually tear my illustration. And if I had to crop something, I would way rather crop the paper surrounding it than the illustration itself. 
Yay, we've completed another watercolor illustration together. Today, we painted Kara as the Lo-Fi Beats girl. Do you guys have any recommendations for a Kara-inspired Lo-Fi Beats playlist? I would love to put one together, and that way I could share it with you guys while you read 7-Inch Kara. If you're interested in checking out 7-Inch Kara, you can read it for free as a webcomic at 7inchkara.com, or if you're like me and you like your comics in dead tree form, you can buy volume one and volume two from the Natto shop. And if you can't afford it, I totally understand that. It would be a huge, huge favor to me and cost you absolutely nothing and help other comic fans if you took a moment and you filled out a library request form at your local library. It means I get to sell a book. It means you get to read 7-Inch Kara as a book. And it means other people get to enjoy the comic as well. And that is such a phenomenal help for me, you guys. I can't fill out my own library request forms. That is taboo. But if you guys do it, it helps out so, so much. And I really, really, really appreciate it. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I had a lot of fun painting this illustration. Like I said, I was surprised that when I crunched it all together, it was like six hours and that it, it wasn't even just six hours. It was more than six hours, but like I edited all the main meat of the painting into one video and uh, time-lapsed that by eight and then exported that and then <laughs> re-edited it and time-lapsed it at 1.7. So it was really, it's really pretty time-lapse and you gotta be careful with time-lapsing because if you time-lapse it too much, it especially with art, it just becomes kind of like, like gibberish you know, it becomes really hard to follow what the person is doing. And as the artist, it becomes really hard for me to narrate over because all the interesting stuff is so time-lapsed that it's over in the blink of an eye. So I, that's why this one's a little bit longer. But thank you guys so much for hanging out with me for the whole thing. Hopefully you guys learned something today. And if not, hopefully you guys enjoyed listening to the chill lo-fi beats and hanging out with me because I really enjoyed hanging out with you guys. It is always a a pleasure to do so. In fact, I try to hang out with you guys at least twice a week on Tuesdays and Saturdays. So if you are not subscribed and you like what you see here, make sure you hit that subscribe button, click the bell notification to let YouTube know that you want to hear more from me. And if you don't have notifications from YouTube turned on, you might want to turn them on because you're probably missing some really cool stuff from some of your favorite creators. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I'm going to have another great review or tutorial here for you guys really really soon if there's stuff you're interested in seeing let me know what you'd like to learn more about down in the comments below and hopefully this was helpful in helping you guys make art a habit this is made possible thanks to the amazing support of my patrons on patreon thank you guys so much for your support and encouragement over the years and hopefully i'll see you guys soon have a wonderful day guys Bye!